Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the 2025 Initiative New Moon webinar. As we gather today in this cycle of the new moon in, the, in Gemini, we will bring our collective focus to the goal 13 of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Take urgent action to combat climate change and its impacts. And before we start our work tonight, I want to share um, that today, or rather tonight, we uh, uh, gather here in Institute of Psychosynthesis in Florence, Italy. So that's why it's evening for us. Uh, here in one room with Dot Maver, Tar Stewart, and a couple of our uh, colleagues. And in the library where Roberta Asagioli has been working in, and starting the tremendous work of his life of psychosynthesis. Mm -hmm. So over to you, Dot. Thank you, Alexander. <clears throat> we gather once a month at the new moon to focus on a shared vision for the common good that is expressed through the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. We participate in group meditation on these formulated thought forms of solution that address the issues facing humanity and the planet at this time. These SDG thought forms help create physical conditions leading to transformation and elevation of human consciousness. Through this meditation, we energize and magnetize the vision to be radiatory and to reach as many people as possible in order that the sustainable development goals might manifest through many actions. We use the opportunity of the new moon cycles and available astrological energies to distribute, radiate, and anchor intention on the physical plane. As we sound the note of this shared vision through our discussion and meditation work, we support the vibrant activation consolidation, and spread of the will to good throughout humanity. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you, Dot, and welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And um, now is the time when we invite you all to speak your names into the circle. Uh, remembering that we would also love to hear your voices later in the webinar during the discussion, which will follow on from the meditation. So we will follow the names as we have been doing for, for just for a moment. before. We will follow the names through the alphabetical list, which you should have access to from your control panel at the right of your screen, the little um, tag there. Um, so as we go through, um, I will say your name and then you're invited to say hello and your name and where you are and I will welcome you when you are finished speaking and move on to the next person on the list. Um, if we don't hear your voice after 10 or 15 seconds, I'll welcome you anyway and we'll move on. Alexander will unmute you when it's coming up to your turn, so you will also need to unmute yourself. And your microphone should be green when you're ready to speak. So we will start. To um, can you hear me? 
Yes, Rebecca, we yes. can hear you and I want to wel welcome Karen. We can also hear Karen. Okay. We are now broadcasting, so we are now uh, doing the introduction around the circle. So we're going to start with staff. So um, in a minute, I'll come to you, Karen, and say your name and um, we'll love to hear your voice at that time. Um, um, can have you unmuted any of the staff, Alexander, at this point? So we will start with the, the staff, uh, starting with Daniela. Please, Daniela. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, Daniela from Brussels, Belgium. Welcome, Daniela. Thank you. And Darcy? Good afternoon, everyone. Darcy from Washington, D.C., USA. Welcome, Darcy. Dot? Dot Maver calling in from Florence, Italy, and I'm with Tara Stewart, also in Florence, Italy. Welcome, Tara and Dot. Um, just lost my. There we go. Um, and Karen. Are you there, Karen? And can you say your name? It seems that Karen is having problems with her audio. Audio. She just texted and said, I am connected, but no audio. So Alexander will work with her for a moment and let's keep going. Okay. Karen is okay. calling in from Keene, New Hampshire, USA. Thank you, Dot, and welcome, Karen. Okay, and now we're moving on to the list of all of you participants here. So Annette Ebert. Calling in from the South Island, New Zealand. Oh, welcome, Annette. Very cold and dark there at the moment. Yes, <laughs> um, it is. <laughs> thank you for being with us. Annette Lafleur. Hello, this is Annette Lafleur from Denmark, Europe. Welcome, Annette. Antoinette. Good evening. I'm from South Africa. Welcome, Antoinette. Avon. Avon Madison from San Francisco Bay Area. Wish we were all with you in Florence. <laughs> Welcome, Avon. Barbara Annabali. <laughs> Barbara Annabali, welcome Barbara. Barbara Rolfe. Hello everyone, this is Barbara Rolfe in Charlotte, North Carolina, USA. Welcome Barbara. Barclay. Welcome Barclay. Hello, uh, this is Barclay Milne uh, in San Juan de Rio, Mexico. Hello to everyone. Welcome, Barclay. Bridget? Hello, everyone. It's Bridget Murphy calling from Toronto, Canada. Welcome, Bridget. Carsten? Yeah, Carsten Damke from Denmark. <laughs> Welcome, Carsten. Cheryl. Cheryl, I can see you're unmuted. Oh, I hear you now. Okay. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Tell us where you are today, Cheryl. <laughs> where are you today? 
Do you mean Karen? Oh, yes. Karen. I thought you were Cheryl. Oh, this is confusing. Okay. Welcome, Karen. <laughs> yeah, I'm so sorry. I'm uh, having technical problems. I thought I had it all set. And anyway, okay. thank you. You are good. You're good to go. Thank you. So please Very mute welcome. yourself. Hi, yes, this is uh, Karen Cancellosi, and I'm here in Keene, New Hampshire today. <laughs> welcome, Karen. Um, and welcome, Cheryl Binson. Um, we haven't heard. Um, and Christine. I think Chris might be having trouble unmuting. Hello, everybody. Christine from Sunshine Coast, Australia. Welcome, Christine. Welcome, Chris. Deborah. Hi, this is Deborah Bartow from Seattle, Washington, in the USA. Welcome, Deborah. Uh, Elisa Maria. Hello, everyone. It's Elisa talking from. Uh, South America in Brazil, nearby Rio de Janeiro. Oh, welcome, Elisa. Ella? Hi, I'm Ella from Denmark. Welcome, Ella. Thank Irana. you. Irana, please unmute yourself. Yep. Hi, uh, this is Arana from uh, Toronto, Canada. Welcome, Arana. Francine? Welcome, Francine. Francoise. You know, hi, it's uh, Francois uh, calling from uh, Toronto, Canada. Welcome, Francois. Frida. Yes, this is uh, Frida Kemp, also from Toronto, Canada. Welcome, Frida. Gillian. Welcome, Hello. Gillian. Hello, this is Gillian from Norfolk, UK. <laughs> Welcome, Gillian. Thank you. Joe? Hello, everyone. This is Joe at this moment in Orange County, Southern California. Welcome, Joe. John? Hi, it's John Horan in Washington, DC. I'm in the garden watering the flowers. <laughs> Beautiful. Welcome, John. Karen Gendron. Karen, please unmute yourself. Well, this is Karen Gritska from Portland, Oregon. Welcome, Karen Gritska. Lucy? Ah. Hello, this is Lucy calling in from Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, welcome, Lucy. And Karen, I saw that, Karen Gendron, I saw that you unmuted yourself, so I'll just say your name one more time, Karen Gendron. And I say again, namaste all from Southern Oregon, USA. Welcome, Karen Gendron. Um, Lynn Mergia. Welcome, Lynn. Great to have you with us. Michael M. Michael just messaged uh, that he's from Western Canada. Welcome, Michael M. And Michael Stacy. Blessings, everyone. Uh, Michael Stacy from Central Ohio, United States. Welcome, Michael. Um, Peter. I would be trusting. Uh, I don't recognize when uh, I put for the. 
Okay, I'm not sure who we had there. Um, Peter, are you there? Peter Louise? Welcome. Welcome, Peter. Rebecca Frith. You've unmuted, you've muted yourself again, Rebecca. Uh, there you Rebecca, go. Australia. Welcome, Rebecca. Richard. Richard Hood, Sunshine Coast, Australia. Welcome, Richard. <laughs> Ross with that. Welcome, Ross Wither. Sheldon. Good morning, friends. This is Sheldon Hughes from Penn Valley, California. Good to be with you. Welcome. Thank you for being with us, Sheldon. And Thomas. Hello. Hello, everyone. Thomas Born. Born in the Czech Republic, but now in the Institute of Psychosynthesis in Varenza, together with the team. Thank you very much for being with me. Thank you, Thomas. Welcome. So thank you everyone for being here. Um, we are going to hear from Tara Stewart now, who will help us align. And um, Tara was co-founder of the Hill Centre mm -hmm. for Psychosynthesis mm -hmm. in Education, which is now the Hill Centre for Peace Building in Walpole, New Hampshire, USA. Tara is Professor Emeritus in Communication, as well as a writer, educator, speaker, and world traveler. Welcome, Tara, again. We are presently in Florence, Italy, the former home of Dr. Roberto Asagioli. His work in education and therapy always move to the alignment of one with his or her higher self. Today's alignment is Roberto's. Recognize. I have a body. I am more than my body. I have emotions. I am more than my emotions. I have desires. I am more than my desires. I have a mind. I am more than my mind. What am I then? I am a center of pure self-consciousness. I am a center of light. And now, we are together as a group. As a group, we are a center of light within a greater light. Thank you, Tara. The Earth is a ruler of only two signs in the zodiac, <clears throat> Gemini and Sagittarius. And both these energies are directly related to Earth service. Gemini is energy that resolves the oppositions, supporting and producing change. If there is a situation needing resolution, Gemini supports solutions compatible to what is required. <clears throat> Climate action is a deeply polarized issue due to, on one hand, the need for sustainability and conservation, while on the other hand, consumption and the old ways. Gemini steps in helps educate, 
and allows energy to flow and resolve on a different level. We welcome Dr. Karen Cangelosi, a professor of biology at Keene State College in New Hampshire, USA, who incorporates open education practices into her teaching because of its great potential for revolutionizing teaching and learning and the ways in which it resonates very clearly with her passion for social justice. As the Turks and Caicos team coordinator for Reef Check International, Karen established and continues to collect data for a coral reef monitoring program in the Turks and Caicos Islands and runs a reef education program, ecology, conservation, diversity, and marine skills for young student residents. Karen takes an approach to education based on whatever her students are doing in the classroom, addressing real life issues. With colleagues around the world, she is expanding the integration of open education practices in connection with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Karen is also an advocate of diversity, gender equity, and inclusion, and has a special interest in the behavioral ecology of spiders. Welcome, Karen. Thank you. It's really great to be here. Am I on now or? We are on now, Karen, and we're going to share the screen with you. Okay, great. So, yeah. okay, you can see the screen? Yes. We see okay. all of your screen. I'm trying to find presenter mode. Okay. Um, so I'm really happy to be talking to all of you about uh, open education today. Is everybody ready for me to get started? Yes, thank okay. you. <laughs> all right, I'll, I'll try to be fast. I may have too many slides here. Um, because open education may be new to a lot of people, I just wanted to give a little bit of a brief introduction. The uh, three uh, cornerstones. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm just going to say one word. As there are so many of us from so many different countries. Yep. So we would rather take in less slides and more of you. So if you would just speak a little slower. So Tomas across from me, his eyes got big. He, to follow for everyone to follow along, we need to speak a little slower. A little oh, slower. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> the language. Okay. Um, sure. So I was just talking about open education. And it has uh, three main components. We talk about open educational resources, uh, the pedagogical practices that come from using those resources. And uh, you may have heard of open access publishing, which I'm not going to talk about today. Primarily, we're talking about students and learning and what students can contribute to the world through their learning. <clears throat> students are in debt through uh, certainly within the United States. It's topped over one and a half trillion dollars, and that's true for, for other countries in the world as well. And so solving the debt crisis is part of the problem. Many of our students in the U.S. are um, food insecure. Many are housing insecure. Many are homeless. And this is prevalent in all regions of the U.S. and, and in Canada and increasingly in other places where there's less and less support for higher education. And part of that is the fact that textbook prices have risen three to four times the rate of inflation. Um, I'm bringing this up because the idea that students can't access textbooks means that they take fewer classes, they drop classes, they fail courses. And so open educational resources provide free resources for students. And um, in addition to being free, they are also usually digitally based. They can be multimedia, downloadable, adaptable, current, public, openly licensed, which I'm gonna mention, and, and free. And, and I want to talk about resources because the resources do influence how students learn and why students learn. 
Um, and the fact that open educational resources have already saved students millions of dollars in textbook costs worldwide. But this is about more than textbooks. Uh, this is an example of open educational resources. Um, and um, we talk about free as in getting something for free, like free beer, if you can find free beer. But we also talk about free as in freedom. And so the idea that you can lay licenses on top of work that would uh, that is also copyrighted. You can have you create material and it has a copyright. But when you put a Creative Commons license on top of that, that means that you have opened it up for the world to be able to use it, to read it, to remix it, to adapt it. Um, I just put these up here to to show the variety of licenses that people can choose to use through the Creative Commons, which which is a global licensing system. And so when we talk about free as in freedom now. These resources, um, again, give us what we call the five R's in the open education movement. That's being able to reuse materials, to revise them, to remix them, to redistribute them, and you can still retain copyright over them. And what's important is that students can find material, use material, and, and so we're thinking about knowledge as not being privately owned by any one individual, but becomes part of a knowledge commons, and that's a really powerful way of thinking about learning. And so we move from thinking about open educational resources to open pedagogical practices. Um, and, and the other thing is that it's not just about textbooks. Resources that can be openly licensed can include things like open lab notebooks and open data sets and videos and lab simulations and software. And there's a huge variety. There are many flavors of open educational resource, which is something that I like to talk about so that this is not a movement about textbooks. And it's not really even a movement just about cost. It's about, it's about learning and sharing. And so when we talk about open pedagogy, we're talking about community and collaboration over content and that we're sharing resources, ideas, and power with our students, that connecting to the wider public within their local communities and across the globe is an important part of the ethos of open pedagogy that learners are contributing to, not just consuming knowledge. This is a really powerful idea here because we often think of education as, you know, open up a student's mind and download information into it and they would memorize it and spit it back for a test. But now we're talking about students learning and creating, not just consuming knowledge, but contributing knowledge to that knowledge commons that I mentioned. That students having their own agency and taking ownership over their learning processes is also very critical to thinking about open pedagogy. And even though we talk about digital tools, we're very critical about those tools. Which ones are owned by private corporations trying to sell things to our students or trying to steal their data? And which ones are free and open that our students can actually use for, for powerful changes for themselves in the world? <clears throat> and so this infographic summarizes a little bit more about what I mean about open pedagogy being about access, access to knowledge, access to the, be able to create knowledge, access to be able to share that knowledge with others, <clears throat> but also access to participating in the community and collaborating with others within your local and far, farther reaching communities, um, and to be able to design your own learning structures, whether it's designing assignments or the syllabus or grading yourself even. But access also means that you can't have access to any of these other things unless you have things like food and gas and laptops or accessibility features like captions or safety and a lot of other things that mean that we want to be accessible to all students, not just some elite few. <clears throat> and so this quote that I love from my colleague when she talks about access, when my students gain access to knowledge, I want it to be part of a larger invitation that we trust, and we're talking to our students here, that we trust that you have important lessons to teach the world and that the knowledge you access today will be changed by your perspectives and will open doors to new ideas that we, your current teachers, never could have imagined teaching you or could have taught you. And so the idea that we want to be able to teach students things that we can't even imagine teaching yet really 
changes the relationship of what it means to be a professor in the classroom and what it what it is that we bring to our students. <clears throat> Here's just some quick examples of students creating knowledge and putting it into uh, shells that are called um, this is a called a press books platform and my students are writing about uh, uh, environmental issues including climate change within a tropical marine biology class coral, coral, coral bleaching ocean warming oil spills many other things and so they're not just writing papers and handing them in to me but they're writing this and sharing this with the world <clears throat> They can use web spaces that we refer to as domain of one's own, where students can interact, they can collaborate, and they can share openly licensed material that they create. And so when we talk about contributing to and not just consuming from the knowledge commons, <clears throat> we have a very tangible way for students to be able to do that. And this is an example of a website constructed by a student of mine, and you can see the, the open license on here. And that when she first wrote this, it got picked up by others in different parts of the world. There were people in Turkey that were reading this and started syndicating everything that she wrote after that. And so that what a powerful thing for a student to say, I'm not just doing an assignment for my teacher, I'm, I'm changing the world with my words. So that audience beyond the professor and connecting to the public becomes the main piece that our students are thinking about. So if they're writing articles about coral reefs and how climate change is affecting them, or how students on spring break are harming the oceans when they throw trash on the beach. This is a student that had a message for her peers and said, I want to I want to talk about what you're doing on spring break and what that's contributing. <clears throat> this is an example of a student who was an education major and we were having a discussion in class about how sometimes it's only those students that are in advanced placement courses in high school that learn about climate change. And she says, I'm upset by this. this. This is material that should be available to all students in all schools. And so she didn't just rant about it. She wrote about it. She shared it in a social media space. It got picked up by many other educators. And so she's feeling the, the value of her work. <clears throat> Science communication is, is such a powerful thing. And when students do it, this is what we're calling open pedagogy. Here are students writing about local contamination sites in the Keene, New Hampshire area. And, and serving a public service to, to letting others know about these toxic phthalates that, that are everywhere and why we should care about them. Another example of a student writing about why, why global warming is real. And we talk about non-disposable assignments because often students write papers and then you grade them and then you turn them back or even the students don't even pick them up at the end of the semester and they sit in a pile somewhere. And what happens to them? often they get thrown in the trash can, like, like what a waste of knowledge. So when we think about assignments that go on that students keep and that go on and live past the end of the semester, I have students in classes that graduated two years ago that are still writing and sharing because of what they learned in their classes and are still contributing knowledge to the knowledge commons. <clears throat> Another powerful tool is using Wikipedia to be able to do this. Um, literally millions of people go on Wikipedia and some people say oh that's Wikipedia is terrible but in fact um, it can be edited and so if you think it's bad you can get in there and you can create and you can edit and students can do this and this is an example of a colleague at West Virginia University who went in and changed all the gender bias and racial bias uh, in articles that her students were reading on Wikipedia. So they went into Wikipedia, they edited it, they added it, they made it more inclusive and shared that back to the world. Uh, talk about really powerful way to contribute. Um, using social media for learning and connecting, people often criticize social media like Twitter or Facebook. And um, I often say that Twitter is, is a tool you know, like a hammer is a tool. You can smash a windshield with it or you can build a beautiful home. And we try to teach students how to use Twitter and other social media tools for learning and connecting and sharing. So they can share links on the websites that they're creating and they can have conversations with other professionals. And, and here's a, a quote from a student who talked about how she got into several conversations with professionals and wanting to uh, figure out how to change the world and things that she needed to do to be able to make that happen. And so the work that she was doing and writing was being read by other professionals and she was having discussions and continues to have these discussions on, 
on social media today. So these are really powerful ways to enact open pedagogy. Uh, KSC Marine Bio is a hashtag for my marine biology class that I had this past semester. <clears throat> and so the, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are very much an important part of what many of us are thinking about. We have, we have partnerships with Montgomery College in Maryland and with Kwantlen Polytech University in Canada. And Keene State is now joining this collaborative partnership to develop uh, uh, fellowships for faculty to develop open pedagogy assignments that connect directly with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which includes the Climate Change Action Goal, as well as many of the other goals. And so we're excited to be able to offer faculty financial incentives to be able to continue to do this work. Um, I want to just talk about trust, power, and agency, um, because our students um, being able to learn in this way means that they can do things that we don't often think about right now in traditional or conventional educational systems. The students can actually create the content of the class. They can write the syllabus. They can determine what goes on. When my students come into class, I say, what do you want to do today? <laughs> they can write their own attendance policy. They can determine how they want to be graded. They can create things like learning outcomes, design the assignments, and because it's when I say I give my students freedom and agency, they can decide what they want to make public. I don't force them to make it public. They can decide whether or not they want to openly license their work. And so this is all part of the ethos of open that makes the learning more powerful in so many ways. And so I often think about how when students are anxious, whether they're under financial stress, when they feel powerless, that there are ways in which systemic issues in education are contributing to that. We have standardized grading and um, multiple choice tests. Students are so focused just on their grades, um, the high costs of education, the surveillance systems that they're under. They're also stressed because of systemic issues that we have in the world at large that include economic, environmental, social, and cultural issues. And so OER with cost savings and open pedagogical practices, you know, go part way towards addressing the issues of student anxiety and financial stress. And this other piece, which I think is particularly powerful, what I call, which I call the sort of the positive feedback loop of open pedagogy, is that students create and share knowledge that address the very systemic issues that are causing them anxiety to begin with. And so this is the, the powerful way in which we see the connections of open pedagogical practices and what they can be in the world. <clears throat> um, so I want to just share a quote from one of my students. Uh, this method of learning, although unconventional, also allowed everyone within the class to create really good relationships. I think part of this stems from the fact that there's no underlying competition to be the best in the class or the smartest. I feel like this is something that can help me in my future, having myself and my peers remember the good relationships formed within these classes. So this student learned about connecting and collaborating in relationship and something she wants to bring into the rest of her life. And students are so often taught to just be competitive over grades. And this other piece about, I think that the most valuable thing that I've learned <coughs> is that uh, that I have in my abilities because my my peers and, and, and other teachers actually value the work that I do. Th these are really powerful outcomes of this kind of learning system as well. Um, I want to uh, just end with a couple of more quotes. Um, we have to remember that open is a process, not a panacea. It's the ways in which we as teachers and facilitators and administrators and students enact it. And we have to be very deliberate and conscious about that. And um, finally, we need to think about questions that we're asking, not tools and resources. What are some ways to make education more accessible and equitable for all students? When we're opening up, we're talking about open for whom. We need to be careful that we don't reenact the, the colonizing modes of education that we might have. We don't want to replicate that in open education. How do we authentically give our students a voice and power when designing learning structures? How do we help the public see the value in what our students are achieving? How can we provide transformational, not just transactional, experiences for our students? And how, what, how might we inspire students to become agents of social change? And so I'm going to end with this quote by Henry Giroux, 
that education is vital to the creation of individuals that are capable of becoming critical social agents, willing to struggle against injustices and develop the institutions that are crucial to the functioning of a substantive uh, democracy. So um, thanks for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Karen. Deep appreciation for sharing with us on the webinar. And we're going to hear from Tara Stewart and then we'll do a meditation and then we are going to open up to questions, comments, and insights. So yeah, thank you so much. You're welcome. Tara? From the Eternal out of the past, in the future, in the present, for the future. That's Roberto Asagioli. The webinar today is coming to you from the Istituto di Sicosintesi in Florence, Italy, the former home of Dr. Roberto Asagioli. His work in personal and transpersonal psychology known as psychosynthesis, established the educational and therapeutic recognition of the higher self or the soul. It was my privilege to study with Dr. Asagioli here in Florence as well as in Tunbridge Wells, England. With the endorsement and encouragement of Dr. Asagioli, Audrey Bestie, a co-worker from London, and I, in 1970, founded the Hill Center for Psychosynthesis in Education, located in Walpole, New Hampshire, USA. The educational, national, and international work of the Hill Center continues today with the fundamental principles of psychosynthesis dedicated to peace building. Through the conclusion of the 20th century and the beginning of this 21st century, there is a continuing expansion of dedicated servers and groups throughout the world, working to achieve a unifying energy and support for meeting the great needs of all life. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are an example of that commitment. Much of Dr. Sogioli's thought and study can be directly related to the challenges of planetary climate action. Therefore, since we're broadcasting from Florence, Italy, Roberto's formal, formal home, I will incorporate some of his ideas in this presentation. Out of the past. The keynote of these turbulent times is action. To survive, all must act and therefore change because we human beings are propelling the climate catastrophes. In the present, action involves change and change is a veiled opportunity in the present. All life involves action, adaptation. This is fundamental to living. Earth, our living planet, is continually involved in cycles of evolutionary action. Humanity numbering over seven billion is a force in the dynamics of this planetary climate and therefore must act constructively toward sustainable development. Roberto once commented, everything which happens to us, to humanity, is for a needed change of pattern. Every change of pattern is for the release of strength, for a group, for all humanity. The object of life is growth. He continued by stating, there is an urgent need to arouse the use of the will. 
in the present. The opportunity inherent in climate action involves, one, moving from reactive to active positive change. Two, realizing that knowing is not enough. Right ac action anchors one's knowing. Three, in the realization that acting in the present is toward the future of climate sustainability. We are the ones who are realizing the inner change, the transition of changing ourselves. We are the change agents, accepting our responsibility to act rather than react. Therefore, climate action demands climate consciousness. This consciousness is activated through the use of the will, the loving will for our living earth. Roberta at one time also commented, inner growth invariably produces outer results, outer service. The way of life takes the place of the way of work. Climate action demands climate consciousness that is activated through the use of the will, the loving will for our living earth. Climate consciousness is the loving will which includes one, causing no harm to our living earth. Two, commitment to caring for our living earth. Three, recognizing the beauty, the resilience of our living earth. Climate action becomes a causal force resulting in affecting a unity of response, a unifying conscious response of humanity in action. Eventually through positive climate action, there will be a transformation in all life towards sustainable development. <clears throat> Let us recognize what climate action is presently happening in the consciousness of our world. For example, Indonesia. Drought-resistant native crops are helping Indonesian women gain financial independence. An ancient variety of sorghum indigenous to Indonesia is being reintroduced largely to women farmers. The use of costly pesticides has been reduced, lessening the harmful environmental effects. Sorghum requires less water, allowing farmers to adapt to climate change. Chile, India, Jordan, these nations are at the top of the annual survey by Bloomberg New Energy Finance Index in regard to adding more clean power capacity than the fossil fuel generation. All three countries are experiencing significant renewable energy booms. Climate action has initiated a unifying recognition of oneness, unity of all life in constructive action becomes inevitable. For example, <clears throat> Uganda. Elephants began raiding farms and invading villages in Northern Uganda as communities displaced by decades of fighting returned to areas that they had abandoned. Herds of elephants had been freely roaming the region, helping themselves to fruits and vegetables grown by returning humans. Attacking the elephants threatened the ecological balance, as well as the country's largest economic resource, tourism. Tourists come to see the gentle giants. A diverse variety of solutions didn't resolve the elephant invasion. However, elephants are afraid of bees. 
They fear being stung in their trunks, eyes, mouth, and therefore, if bees are present, elephants run away. Beehive fences have stopped about 80% of marauding elephants. <clears throat> the presence of life can never be eliminated. Nature will persist. Every living thing has its purpose. There is resilience in nature's ability to transcend human conflict and initiate renewal, adaptation, and reconstruction. Individual response and commitment are not enough. Group initiative, commitment, and creative action are required. Thailand. A Buddhist Lama pledged that he would plant 1,000 trees to restore an area of land that had been clear-cut by the local people to provide wood for cooking fires and building materials. However, he knew that the young trees would be cut if not protected. He and other lamas from the monastery placed a small statue of a Buddha by every tree they planted. Now there is a young forest of Buddhas blessing every maturing tree. During a tutorial with Roberto, I asked him a question. He paused, looked at me and said, Oh, Tara, have a full faith in life. I wondered and pondered his action and answer. Now I live a full faith in life. For the future, as a at a tutorial, Roberto said, all can therefore strive toward achieving a consciousness, that awakening, that inner light, which when seen and intelligently used, will serve to reveal other aspects of what is the possibility unfolding as a new civilization. From the eternal, out of the past, in the present, for the future. Thank you, Tara. Let's take just a, a moment before we enter our meditation to take in these sharings from Karen and Tara. And following the meditation, there will be an opportunity for all of us to share. We visualize our group centers as we take a unified breath and align ourselves within the group field. Our hearts unite across distance and we extend our group light to illuminate and experience the loving heart of Gaia that is ever present in the one life. As a group, we lift our consciousness and we look at Mother Earth, Gaia, in all her beauty and with all the present challenges. And we see the sustainable development goals 
a blueprint that countries have agreed upon. We hold this thought form in the group mind. As we focus now our attention on goal 13, climate action. To take urgent action to combat climate change and its impacts. And we enter the power of silence together. As we gently register our impressions, we see climate action expressing through policies, education, and cooperation as we realize the livingness of no one left behind and build our resilience all over the world. And now we anchor the thought form and distribute the energy gathered as we sound together the mantra. Let the forces of light bring illumination 
to all humankind. Let the spirit of peace be spread abroad. May all those of goodwill everywhere meet in a spirit of cooperation. May forgiveness on the part of all of us be the keynote at this time. Let power attend the efforts of the great ones. So let it be and help us to do our part. Oh. Oh. you everyone and thank you Tara and Karen and Dot for bringing us all those thoughts and ideas about as a way to expand our perception of climate change and how we can relate to it. So we now come to the time um, when all of you can share thoughts, ask questions, um, and contribute generally to the to the group sharing and the group field. So um, just feel welcome to raise your hand using the little hand icon on your control panel. If you would like to speak, we'd love to hear you. And um, you can also type into the chat box, uh, into the questions box, if you have some questions and we can read them out. If you would like to speak, please use the function raise your hand. Uh, it's a button on the control panel and we will unmute you as you can contribute. And Karen, this is, this is Dot. Uh, I know that people are interested in the clip that you had sent. Is it possible you could post the link to that? Um, about the this, SDGs and uh, yes, and open education. I can I can um, create a link to all of the slides and share that. Mm -hmm. That would be great. And the little video that your colleague did about SDGs and open ed, if that's possible, that would be great. Okay, um, you want me to share those right now um, or later? Now would be, now good, would yeah. be great because people can take the them with them. If, if possible, okay. the slides we can do later and make available, okay. but at least we already mm -hmm. shared open facts. Say that again. We shared open stacks. Oh, oh open stacks. Yeah, that's just one small thing. Right. Um, yeah, I will find uh, Rajiv's uh, Excellent. piece on. Uh, yeah, give me a second on that.
there are several uh, comments, uh, so that could you read them in the chat? <coughs> Alisa says, you can't measure the gratitude that encounter inspired, knowing so many positive and constructive ways to face the problems inspires. Many thanks to each and all. Here from Brazil, we send our best regards to all. Lynn shares, this session has been a blessing for the entire planet. Yeah, Karen, as you were sharing, I was so aware of the many conversations that we've had. Uh, thank you for agreeing to come on and share with all of us. It's challenging with all the negative coverage of all the disasters presently uh, to know, to realize that there is so much good happening and much of it through our education system with professors like yourself. So if you want to give us any other inspirations, feel free. Um, <laughs> yeah, I love to hear people's reactions to the idea of just changing our educational system completely. So if, if anyone has any thoughts or suggestions or anything related to what I said, clarification, I'm happy to I'm happy to share more about that if there's something specific. I also just put the link to Rajiv Janjiani's United Nations talk in the chat box. And I see that Michael has his hand raised. Thank you. Uh, there's a couple of things I want to touch on. First, I want to thank Karen and Tara for the very wonderful presentations that they gave to us. Uh, second, I wanted to bring forward from the June issue this year of Scientific American Magazine. Uh, on the last page, on page 80, there's a graphic of uh, three of the UN SDGs, uh, water goals, energy goals, and food and agricultural goals. And this graphic shows positive synergies, which um, for, for just those three, uh, and it shows how they can reinforce progress in others and, and states that overall water targets have the greatest benefit in terms of those three again. But then there's also negative trade-offs where pursuing one target can undermine another where several water, food, and energy targets had one counterproductive trade-off, yet most of them had more than one positive synergy offsetting the complication. Um, and so I just wanted to bring that forward. And third, uh, since we have been learning and, and hopefully working at understanding that thoughts are things, I have a hypothesis that since thoughts are things, when we focus our thoughts on love and remove those thoughts from the glamours created through unloving thoughts, we can, through that means, have a very significant impact on the rising climate temperatures. And so I, I kind of put that forward as uh, something that uh, either Tara or Karen might wish to respond to. Uh, Tara, if you want to, if you want to go ahead. This is Tara, responding to your, your very valuable, insightful portion regarding love. And what I'm learning is that love is the connector, the connecting tissue in life itself. 
trees communicate and literally love each other and themselves. So do plants, so does the earth, and so do we as people have that capacity. And that capacity is goodwill in action. <clears throat> it's a very worthwhile basic definition, if you wish, of love, goodwill in action. And each one of us, in our own way, can practice that in every single day. Goodwill, love in action toward ourselves, toward others, toward known and unknown people, and toward our living earth. I guess I could, um, I guess one of the things I could add is when I think about um, the, one of the last things that I shared about students talking about the social environment of their classroom that I thought would be particularly um, you know, powerful for this group is that um, I think the fact that um, students in classrooms th that are eventually going to become adults in the world and the idea of, mo you know, the idea that they're modeling cooperation and caring and love for the earth in, in intellectual spaces where they're simultaneously learning the academic information about you know, what is the biology and the chemistry of what happens during climate change and being able to really create synergies between the intellectual capacities that we're understanding in order to address problems, which I think is essential. Um, but, but the synergy between that intellectual work and the, the work that we do in our, in our hearts and creating compassion within our students to, to do this work for love for the community and for the earth, I think is, is really critical. So I'm hoping that we're finding ways to bring those synergies together. I see that Jillian has her hand raised as well. Uh, yes, hello, thank you for today. Very interesting. Um, I was reading today some good news in the Cosmos Journal that uh, CO2 emissions are decreasing despite growing economic activity in 22 different countries. Pakistan is planting 1 billion trees in, a new prov in the northwestern province. And France, India and the Netherlands are laying out plans to eliminate fossil fuel powered automobiles. And on a personal note for me, I think it would be useful if um, the uh, growing of food in cities and um, roof gardens and living walls were expanded. Thank you. See that Sheldon also has his hand raised. I just wanted to follow up on this recent um, <clears throat> focus on love that, that Michael echoed it and he had me even more details. Thank you, Tara and Karen, for your marvelous presentations. By the way, I never learned so much in one session <laughs> about open education. This is just a, a terrific. So thank you very much for that. I just want to point out that um, how the notion of a blessing today is so appropriate. I mean, here. Stott pointed out we have in Gemini both the Earth and Sagittarius are, are two signs in which this energy arises very strongly as in us. And of course in Gemini, the great energy of the second ray, the ray of love wisdom of the Christ is, is fully present. So when I think about love um, and action, um, what loving action means, this was this was so much about it, all the way from seeing ourselves basically as um, pure self-consciousness, you know, and all standing in that particular way, understanding of ourselves in a group field, through thinking of ourselves as, as learners and teachers at the same time, as students, always bringing out, bringing out the ideas that 
and blessing the world from that perspective. So this was just a, another way to think, talk about blessing that's coming to us as far as I'm concerned from all of you who have spoken and um, the, the, was it fortuitous or was it planned this way <laughs> that we have this coming on the early energies of Gemini, which within which we can bathe in and, and act not so much from a point of view of desperation or must take change, but just from our love of the earth, what we all need to survive and prosper, be the selves that we are. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sheldon. It's Michael Stacy is also wanting to share. I think Michael did speak before. We were offline. My, sorry, I missed you, Michael. Oh. We lost, <laughs> lost our Wi Fi for a few minutes here. That happens. <laughs> I know. I want to add um, that probably this goal 13, more than any other goal uh, among all the 17 goals, required, requires collective action. Because that's the, the challenge that we all face collectively, and we can address it only through the collective action, collective intention to act together so as we send our energy towards climate action let's think together about that united field of intention of all people of goodwill to act together on all the levels, in all the fields, policies, education, specific actions, but the main thing, intention to work together as one humanity. I think that's such an important point that um, the building of community and collaboration and collective action is absolutely essential, um, especially in thinking about climate action and will be essential in thinking about dealing with the results of climate change, not to, not to bring up a negative note, but there are already, clim the climate is already changing. It's not like we're still talking about preventing it. We're talking about how we're going to deal with it, how we're, how we're living with the consequences of it already. And that definitely is going to require more compassion and collaboration and collective action. Uh, absolutely. So let's hold this intention in our mind in our hearts and continue our work together. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Karen and Tara, for your sharings on this webinar. And thank you. Viviana's yeah. with us from Instituto Psychosynthesis here in Florence, Italy. Thank you for opening your doors to us all day today. Grazie. Grazie. <laughs> Very nice. So um, we uh, will be closing our sharing today. And uh, before I will uh, pass the microphone to Rebecca for the closing uh, 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 mantra, I want to uh, invite you to join us in the new cycle. Uh, bringing our collective focus to the next sustainable development goal, uh, goal 16. We suggest that in the cycle of Gemini cancer, we uh, focus on 
uh, peace, justice, and strong institutions. And uh, our Camp New Moon webinar will be on July 3rd. So let's, through our daily meditation, bring our focus to, on that goal and on our uh, intention uh, to implement that goal. And also, we invite you to join uh, to Gemini uh, gathering on uh, the days of the full moon on June 15th and the 16th, when we will uh, share together in a circle and meditate together on the right relationships and how we come from capacity to service, putting our capacities into service to manifest right relationships. So please join us. And uh, I forgot to mention uh, that uh, reminds me that the next new moon webinar in Cancer will be focused by the Signet a group from Sunshine Coast Australia. So saying that, I pass the microphone to you, Rebecca. Thank you, Alexander, and thank you, everyone. Um, I would like to invite us to close today with some words from Albert Schweitzer that seem to really fit with how the webinar has involved, uh, evolved today. So as we enter another moment, just a moment of silence to, to finish, which will start and finish with the sound of a bell, as we close the webinar, um, I offer the words of Albert Schweitzer, who says, a man is truly ethical only when life as such is sacred to him. That of plants and animals as that of his fellow men. And when he devotes himself helpfully to all life that is in need of help. 